So our first talk this morning is from Rusty Birchfeld of, of uh, Zvents, with, along with uh, Josh Tyler with him. And they're going to be talking about some really massively large storage solutions for working with Active Record. <coughs> okay, take yep. it away. So, uh, thank you for coming. I'm Rusty from Zvents, and uh, basically we have things to do uh, in your area. And I'm going to be talking about Hypertable and how we use it. And to start off with, I'd like to just show you, uh, give you an idea of what kind of stuff we do with it. So uh, basically here we have a report for the past month. This is hourly data that's queried directly from Hypertable live. So um, I could actually change this to say, okay, I want the 16th and execute that, and that's pulling back a full month's worth of data hourly and displaying it, and I can compare that to the previous month. <clears throat> so that's thousands of records retrieved and rendered into this, the, the web here <clears throat> in just a second or so. And I have a couple other uh, examples here. This is the same thing, but daily. And here's for a movie. Um, lots of data. And some performance numbers. We actually, uh, this is an, it's actually an old benchmark, but on a cluster of nine machines, we achieved one million random inserts per second sustained. Uh, and that's using uh, AOL query log data that was uh, released a long time ago. Um, so what is Hypertable? It's uh, an open source Bigtable implementation. Uh, if you're not familiar with Bigtable, it's used at Google. They released a paper on it a number of years ago. And Hypertable is available now for anybody to use rather than Bigtable, which is, of course, only for Google. Um, the basic premise behind it is that it's this basically a big sorted map. And you can, uh, using the, the keys, you can represent multiple dimensions. So there are five parts to the key. And each of these parts you can think of as a dimension. So the row key is the, the main uh, index. That's the only thing that's indexed. That's part of, uh, part of what makes it fast. And then the, uh, the column family is what you would think of as a normal column in like MySQL or Postgres. And the column qualifier is data, actually. So you can store data in the key, and that allows you to create some interesting, uh, interesting data layouts where you could have like a, um, like a tag name in the, in the qualifier and then the number of occurrences of that tag, for instance, in the actual cell. And then uh, timestamp and a revision, so you can actually store version data in there as well. So you could have several cells with uh, each of the versions of, a, of that cell over time. And currently, it only stores strings, uh, which is usually not a big deal. This is the basic architecture. You have the master server and a bunch of range servers that are all running on different machines, usually. And all of those machines are talking to HDFS, the Hadoop distributed file system. It works with other file systems as well. And uh, basically, the, you have rows represented by a row key. And that row may have many cells in the, in the database. It's sparse. You don't have to have data for every single cell in that row. And those rows are in ranges, <coughs> row ranges. and the ranges are distributed amongst the range servers, and the master knows where those ranges are. So when you need some data, you ask the master, hey, where's the, the range for this row? And it'll tell you which server to talk to, and you retrieve the data directly from that server. If a range server goes down, then the master will bring up another range server somewhere else and tell it where the data is on HDFS. So. Uh, that's sort of an introduction to what Hypertable is. Uh, now for some information on how to use it. The, 
primary interface is a C API, but that's not as interesting as the Thrift Broker interface, which actually uh, provides access in a, a bunch of different languages, including Ruby, of course. And that's actually what we use a lot at Zvents. Um, there's actually uh, a hyper record interface, which is an extension of Active Record to support Hypertable. So this is actually what powers those graphs you saw earlier. And uh, basically, we had to subclass Active Record because there is SQL in Active Record, and Hypertable doesn't support the same SQL statements. So I have an example for you of uh, a small application. I had to restart my laptop here. So uh, if we look at this, currently there aren't any pages listed in here. This is just a small, um, uh, small Rails app that's using HyperRecord. But I'm actually going to load up the HyperTable shell here. And you can see there aren't, there's any data in pages. But I'm going to load in some data. This test that out file here has the first 10,000 articles from Wikipedia. So that's um, the title and the body of each article. So we can load that in. That happens pretty quickly. This is on my laptop here, so it's not the uh, speediest thing ever. But um, it's approximately 150 megabytes of data. And that just loaded in 14 seconds at approximately 14K per cell, 600 cells per second. And now if we go over here, this will probably take a moment to load because there are 10,000 pages now. And actually, we could do, uh, well, here we go. So if we look at like the page for A, there's all the data from Wikipedia. I can't render it, but um, lots of data. So um, oops. if we go back to the presentation. So basically, there are a bunch of considerations, things you have to take into account when you're dealing with a database like this. It's not your standard relational database. It can't handle joins or um, secondary indexes. So a lot of times you have to denormalize your data, store it in the format that you intend to query it rather than in this normalized format and then doing a whole bunch of abstract or um, uh, arbitrary queries on it. So. There are lots of technologies like MapReduce and so forth to allow you to aggregate your data in various formats. And we actually make use of those at Zevents. Um, and those are really useful for providing those denormalizations. Um, column families and qualified columns. Using these different, uh, using the qualifiers, you can store data in the column name. So for instance, um, well, I already gave an example on that, but basically uh, the, the data that we are looking at here, the format for this is the row key, which contains the, uh, the type and the event and the ID. So in this case, it would be like movie underscore or whatever the ID is. And then we have the, uh, a column called uh, detail views. And then there are qualifications on that column for each time that we're dealing with, each hour. And then in each hour's bucket, in each cell, we have the value for that hour. So here you can actually see the, uh, the qualifier for the column and then the value for the cell. And then, of course, you can store version data as well. And Hypertable even uses that to represent deletes. So to make a delete fast, instead of actually going and removing all of your data, it just inserts a new cell saying that this cell has been deleted. And then all of the, then a maintenance job comes back later and cleans up all of the, those deletes. So, um, uh, 
Well, basically, um, that covers it. Questions? So um, the question was, how do we how do we break down by hours on our chart? So um, well, the data is stored per hour, and for instance, like the daily data, we're actually aggregating that in on the Ruby side. Um, it's much less efficient to do it that way, but HyperTable's been so fast for us, we haven't had to uh, create a new denormalization for that yet. Okay. Yes. So that string is the, the column qualifier. And so since HyperTable doesn't support anything other than strings, even though like there's a timestamp field there, the timestamp is actually stored as a string. And it's just, um, it can be lexic lexically sorted so that it actually comes into the map as a key that sorts reasonably. Sorry, sorry, what was that? Oh, uh, no, I'm not storing the images. I just took a, a SQL dump and pulled out only the the title and the body. That's what all those inserts you saw. Um, so that's 9,999 cells. All of those cells were the bodies of the articles, and then the row key is the title. So the key size here, 15 bytes, that's the average number of bytes in a title, and then the 15K is the average size of a body. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So you, uh, you buy them all into third or and stuff like that, and you write them like only wrappers or something like that. Is that right? So um, this is just a, a crude example, but if you wanted to store the images, then you could just have another cell that would be like the image cell. So you'd have the body cell and then like, uh, or I guess, so an image, I see what you're saying. Images are just another page on Wikipedia. So in that case, the body could be the actual image data if you wanted it to be. Uh, so it does support a certain amount of the things that you would expect from SQL. It does support limit. Um, the but it is somewhat limited. It it uh, most of the focus has been going into like the back end and then opening up interfaces that are like the thrift interface and stuff like that. Well, uh, the primary thing is for our metrics right now. We have a ton of reporting, and then we also. Um, well, we, we actually use cascading a Hadoop framework to load all of our, to process our log data and convert it into a format that we then load into HyperTable, and that's how we actually get that data. So uh, basically with cascading, instead of having to specify uh, maps and reduces individually, which you would have to do if you're using MapReduce directly, you specify the operations you want to compute. So you say like, okay, I want to do a filter, I want to do uh, some uh, arithmetic or whatever, and then I want to group and sum or whatever kind of aggregation you want. And then the framework will, will schedule that and optimize it down into as few MapReduce jobs as, nece as necessary and run those on the cluster in dependency order. And then basically we take the results of that and those go into HyperTable. And one of the things we're actually working on right now is a, a thrift connector for cascading so that we can connect our MapReduce jobs directly to HyperTable and then we can load data in from HyperTable and directly back out into HyperTable 
and that'll allow us to do a lot of neat things with denormalized data. So if we want to aggregate up data from uh, hourly to daily buckets, we can then just run a job to collect all that and stick it right back in without having to hit the file system. The Hadoop stuff? Um, let's see. Here's some, this is like the code that generates the, the detailed stuff. So basically there's, this is actually Java code. I guess I should have said that. The cascading stuff is in Java. Um, there is a Groovy implementation and then somebody took like JRuby and created, recreated the Groovy DSL in JRuby. So that's kind of cool too, but um, that came along after we already started this stuff. But basically the idea is that you can, uh, you can do things, or I guess a lot of this stuff's abstracted out, but like this is a sub-assembly that does a bunch of work, um, like uh, filtering and stuff like that, but here's uh, joining two keys together, two, two fields together, and then here's a group by, and this does a, a count, and then basically it gets spit back out on the file system. So Rusty, one other thing I was gonna mention is maybe our use of the change log so one of the things that we were really excited about getting Hypertable into production for is, um, you know, at Zevents we deal with a lot of user-created content, and a lot of times things change and we don't know why. We have a lot of, you know, malicious or uh, inadvertent kind of changes that happen into our, uh, our, our core production database, and so we wanted to build this thing, we call it the change log, which basically logs everything that ever happens. It's almost like if you took your web logs and just wrote them into a database that you could query arbitrarily. And um, so this gives us an incredibly powerful tool. I don't know how many writes a day we do on that one, um, but uh, an incredibly powerful tool to track everything that happens from, you know, somebody added an image, somebody changed a description, somebody logged in, whatever. Um, and so I think, you know, that, 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 that million inserts per second, that's something that we haven't quite reached in production. Uh, you know, that's, that's a level of success we can only dream of as a, as a web property. But uh, um, we're prepared for that volume of data which is really exciting for us. I don't know if you have anything else to add about that. Or if you wanted to say anything about how, if people are interested in getting started with HyperRecord, what they could do. Yeah, so the code's all up on uh, GitHub. There's actually both HyperTable and HyperRecord up there. And uh, So HyperTable itself has actually gained uh, a pretty good following in the open source community. Uh, Zvents is a sponsor, also Baidu, the, um, the Chinese search engine is, has come on as a sponsor. <laughs> and there's uh, a community growing around that. Um, HyperRecord's doing pretty well. Obviously, we didn't build too much salesmanship stuff into our presentation. We were more focused on getting that demo working. It's, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes just to see that one little thing where it inserted 150 megs in five seconds. But um, uh, yeah, <clears throat> um, we, we encourage people to get involved and try it out. Um, it's a very active community there. Any other questions? Can you describe some of the things you were trying to do, I'm assuming with relational database technology, like a SQL database first, that basically fell down and made you decide to do this, or was this based on past experience like that? Well, so we didn't actually have uh, like a database keel over on us. We wanted to c sort of cut that off. and. Uh, they, uh, we started hypertable development like two years ago. Yeah, this is, this is a long-term effort for us, actually. Yeah. And uh, basically pulling something like 3,000 or 4,000 records in like a few milliseconds or whatever, I don't, I don't know that that's something that, I don't know. It, you know, it, 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 yeah. It, 
we didn't actually hit a pain point where we did croak. Uh, it was more like um, we saw that we were going to have to do something like this to get to the level of um, it's, it's really about analytics for us because a big part of what we do is driven by search relevance um, and we really want to build in a lot more um, sophistication into what we do there rather than just you know looking at tags and timestamps and all that stuff. We have a, this, this tool is going to give us uh, the ability to, to build a lot more into our analytics engine that drives um, local content because the, the search problem for Zvents is actually interesting. It's not a free text search. It actually has many dimensions. There's time, there's location, there's content, and then there's all this user data that we want to feed back into it. So things like the change log, how many times did this thing get accessed, how many times did it get changed, all this stuff, we want to build that into building a better search result. And so we saw, you know, there's going to be more data than we can handle with any relational database, even if we do all the, you know, replication, sharding, whatever. Uh, we wanted something that would really stand up in the long term. So I was wondering if you could speak to what kinds of problems you think are well suited to um, hypertable versus a relational database. Like are there, you know, is it now that you're using it for this, you use it for everything, or? So we're trying to get our, our site moved over to it, um, it's kind of one step at a time. But uh, sort of the canonical example for a use of hypertable is a crawl database. And there's actually an example of that up on uh, the Hypertable wiki. Um, and uh, if we go to the wiki, basically um, the, the, w the amount of data that you can store in it and the flexibility it gives you with uh, storing that data is really powerful. And um, I think it's in That's the performance data. It's in here. So the crawl DB example. Basically, you have a title and a content column, and then there's an anchor column. And the anchor column has qualifications. And by putting the domain name here in reverse, makes it easier to, uh, it sorts better, so you can look it up faster. But basically you can figure out all the anchors that point to a given page very quickly. I guess what Rusty's saying is that if you wanted to crawl the web and put it into a database, rather than just into a text file that you would have to, you know, post-process, extensively. Um, that, that's a good canonical example. Also what we do with the change log, anything where you've just got mountains and mountains of data and you want to be able to preserve sem some semblance of real-time um, interaction with that. There are limitations because it's not truly a relational database. Um, so you'd have to, I mean, any particular application you'd have to see if you'll be okay without those. Well, thank you. Yeah, please talk to us about it.